thanks everybody for coming. I think this is the closeout session of our Healthcare and Life Science first inaugural Healthcare and Life Science track here at reInvent, hopefully the first and many more to come. Uh, my name is Angel Pizarro. I am a, a technical BDM in the scientific computing team for AWS. And today, what we're going to cover is cloud computing, uh, how it's redefining research and creating secure collaborative science at scale on the cloud. And I've got a great set of co-speakers here who I'll introduce as, as they're coming up, uh, Omar Sarang from DNA Nexus and Jeffrey Reed from Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. Okay, so let's get to it because it's, it's a big talk and we don't have very many, uh, much time. So <clears throat> what I thought uh, I would do for you today is set the stage for Omar and Jeff and talk about in general terms what it's like working securely with genomics data on top of AWS. And to use as a case study here, I'm going to put up uh, the NIH dbGaP security best practices, um, uh, the database of genomes and phenotypes. And in a general sense, the, uh, the security best practice guidelines from the NIH cover three general areas. One is being physical security, uh, data center access, and remote administration access of your resources that have sensitive genomic data. They also cover topics about electronic security, uh, these are things like user account security. Do you have strong password policies, password policies that expire over time, that sort of thing. Uh, use of access control lists, so there's authentication and then there's authorization. Uh, other topics like secure networking, encryption of data in transit and at rest, and OS and software patching. And the final large uh, section of the security best practice guidelines is uh, data access security. So authorization, uh, standard operating procedures, how do you authorize access to that data? How do you track the data provenance, copies of that data, and cleaning up after project use? <coughs> so that's the uh, context of working with genomic data on top of any system, uh, cloud, not cloud, private resources. You have to meet these security best practices. When we talk about security and compliance on AWS, and I'm sure you've heard this in a few talks already throughout the, uh, uh, the sessions, we talk about the shared responsibility model. And what that means for controlled access data, what that means for genomics in particular, is that it's a glass half full scenario in terms of having a compliant solution on top of AWS, where we fill up your glass with nice tasty compliance from AWS here. Imagine this is a nice uh, rum mojito. <laughs> and then the second part, the spritzer, is a third-party audit of your standard SOPs. And then you get your delicious mojito on the end. One thing that I'd, uh, I'd like to point out is that this, uh, uh, this shared responsibility model allows you to refocus uh, your security professionals on the actual project at hand, your, your, your business practices that matter to you as opposed to undifferentiated uh, compliance concerns with infrastructure. And it allows you to take advantage of high levels of uniformity and automation that uh, AWS uh, uh, espouses, uses, and uh, essentially requires in order to do this stuff at scale and effectively. Uh, we, we've probably mentioned this a few times during uh, uh, the healthcare and life sciences se sessions, but it's worth noting again that we're the first public cloud provider to achieve the uh, ISO 9001 colon 2008 uh, certification. They love, they love numbers. <laughs> All right, so, yes, uh, okay, so uh, with Amazon, so let's talk about those general areas. Now that we've set up the picture of shared responsibility, we've set up what are the requirements, let's talk about these things specifically. Uh, secure networking, how do, you, how do you protect your resources from the bad guys out there on the internet? Um, with Amazon Virtual Private Cloud, uh, you create secure resources that are not discoverable within the AWS infrastructure. Um, and I'm just gonna give a brief overview of how VPC works, right? So imagine the black line represents one of our regions. The dotted yellow line represents our availability zones. <coughs> what happens with VPC is you define a network address space that spans the region, and then you start creating subnets within that uh, availability zones of each region. Imagine the one on the, your, my, your, this one over here for you guys is the uh, DMZ, uh, so the militarized zone where you can put publicly accessible resources and then you have a completely private subnet in a different AZ or the same AZ. 
the nice thing about VPC is that you control the route tables. You control how traffic goes and flows between them. You control where the resources actually launch. Uh, and you can control how things get access to the internet. So if you need something from your private subnet, uh, you have to specifically attach a public IP to the resources within your DMZ and then allow that DMZ to forward on traffic through, which allows you to do packet inspection of the data that's coming in or out of your VPCs. And finally, we offer a VP uh, virtual private gateway service that, where you can attach to your institutional network uh, uh, IPsec secure tunnels. Uh, so you don't even need the, the internet routing to happen uh, at all through AWS. <coughs> right. Uh, that, that sort of covers the secure networking portion of electronic data security. Uh, let's move on to user and account and resources. Uh, with uh, Identity and Access Management, IAM, uh, the service that we provide, it allows you to do fine-grained permissions on a user and group and security role model that, that, that's very familiar to anybody who's ever uh, uh, managed users or, or shared resources. Nice things that uh, come with IAM, and we've been iterating on this service a lot since it's first introduced, specifically introducing identity federation so that you can take advantage of your Active Directory multi-factor authentication against all our APIs. <laughs> and uh, it's integrated uh, with a lot of our services. So to put the picture home, you have your root account, you have your, uh, the green boxes there represent the, uh, the groups of users within IAM. Administrators uh, can do things like, let me just go here for a second, <coughs> uh, do things like access the network, right, with multi-factor authentication. Since network operations really can open you up to a lot of security, you really wanna lock that down to a few specific people and to very tight security requirements. Your researchers can only go into one availability zone that might have a reduced set of de-identified data. Your operations folks can obviously go into the production systems, and then your uh, EMR functions within uh, applications can not only access the resources, but also at the application level, be able to access the data and, and do operations on it. And that covers uh, roles and responsibilities. Moving on again to, to a different topic, data encryption in, in transit and at rest. Uh, our storage products uh, allow very fine grain permissions to say, I'm only going to allow secure traffic. I'm going to uh, encrypt every object while it's at rest. Uh, and for S3, our storage service, there is two options where we manage the uh, keys and customer managed keys for AWS for server-side encryption. For Amazon EBS, <coughs> uh, the encrypted volumes, it's, it's an AWS managed key solution only at this point. Uh, but with both of these, you should see very minimal performance overhead. And finally, uh, your data prominence. Uh, Amazon CloudTrail uh, is there to access the APIs. It tracks all access to all, all of our APIs uh, and allows you to be notified and do uh, change management, auditing, and reporting at a level that's kind of unheard of in this industry prior to introduction of things like CloudTrail. So let's bring it all home, right? Physical security. Unless you've copied it out to a thumb drive, you're using AWS, you've taken care of this requirement. With electronic security, IAM uh, allows you to do the user account, user account password access control list to resources that live within AWS. Secure networking, obviously VPC enables it. Encryption of the data in transit and at rest, handled by our storage products. And the uh, data provenance is uh, handled by a mix of solutions and shared responsibility. So OS and software patching, because this is a user responsibility, that's completely on you to certify and audit that sort of thing. And uh, I've been pretty busy, so I actually didn't know about any of these things that were coming out prior to writing this uh, presentation, but now, now we have a, a very nice uh, key management service that you can utilize within your own infrastructure to secure your data. We can also have additional tools, sorry, additional tools uh, to inspect your, your, your uh, ecosystem with AWS config, and the service catalog really allows you to lock down what you can offer to your researchers. So I think we're really starting to see 
uh, with respect to genomics and other controlled access data sets, uh, a, a suite of services that really help you meet compliance needs incredibly fast. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand it off to uh, our friends at DNA Nexus, uh, introduce Omar. Omar is uh, Chief Cloud Security, or Chief, sorry, Cloud, Chief, Officer. Chief Cloud Officer for <laughs> DNA Nexus, and he has decades of experience uh, doing global operations and teams and, and, and DevOps uh, prior to joining AWS. He actually was part of, uh, prior to joining DNA Nexus, he was actually part of AWS, so he knows the ins and outs of our product and then some. Great, Omar. thank you very much, Angel. Mm -hmm. So we at DNA Nexus really look at a model of a managed service on top of infrastructure as a service. Uh, I like to say we like to hide the sausage making and present a platform for scientists without IT entanglements. The DNA Nexus platform as a service was launched in full production commercial mode early in 2013. We're located in Silicon Valley, not far from everybody else down there. Uh, and the platform is meant for genomic analysis and for genomic data management with all the attendant security and other controls that need to be in place in order to do that. The platform is serving approximately 20% of the world's sequencing fleet. We are in businesses such as clinical testing. Uh, we have customers that are doing uh, prenatal testing, oncology testing. Uh, that model is really enabled by the platform being able to sit between clinical uh, labs and our customers who are doing the actual analysis and producing the clinical reports. We work in large-scale genome centers, uh, such as Baylor College of Medicine, uh, and including uh, Jeff Reed's brand new Spankin Regeneron Genetic Center. Um, we also really support the interaction between our customers and their partners, which you'll also see some with Jeff Reed as he talks about how the integration of phenotypic data from electronic health records is being collided with genomic information in order to start teasing out the relationship between the genomic variants and genomic structures and phenotypic expression. Some examples of operating at scale, and again, this is really enabled by AWS. We are seeing the state of genomics now coming to the point where the cost of the sequencing has been dropping and the volume of the output from the sequencers has been rising, dropping much faster than Moore's law. And so what's happening now is the next bottleneck is appearing, and that bottleneck is actually in the informatics. This example here is the CHARGE Consortium Project. It's the cohort for heart disease and aging. Uh, I'd have to, let me just, this one's a hard one. Cohort for Heart and Aging Research in Genomic Epide Epide eh. Epidemiology. You can tell I'm not a life sciences guy. But the interesting thing about this consortium is it's a number of different groups, large-scale uh, studies like the Framingham study, the Rotterdam study, ARIC, that are combining the scale of their phenotypic data and genomic analysis to start to drive insight uh, in these longitudinal databases. Uh, this thing had 14,000 individual genomes, some 4,000 whole genomes, some 11,000 exomes. 300 researchers were involved in this consortium all over the world. 20,000 cores that was running at its uh, peak over seven days, and we consumed 3.3 million core hours. And just, you know, so you have some idea of the scale of these things, the 430 terabytes cited here is the result set. We were pushing well over a petabyte of information while all this data was crunching. And so you can imagine why the elasticity of the cloud is so critical here. You don't want to have to, you know, uh, get equipment to hold all those petabytes of working data when you're just going to blow it away a little while later. Same thing with the 3.3 million core hours. That's a pretty large cluster. Um, this actually represented probably the largest genomic analysis ever run in the cloud. The secure collaboration aspect, uh, we really think, in a, as, as I'll say in a few minutes, as we look at some of the barriers to scientific discovery, secure collaboration is critical. You have to get data sets and scientists together in an environment where they can share data tools and do it in a manner where they're comfortable because what happens now, as we'll talk about, is data gets very siloed. This example here we're particularly proud of. This is a Regeneron Genetic Center, which was set up specifically to drive discovery around uh, drugs, that could be used um, uh, based on genetic information. 
Uh, selection of cohorts for clinical trials can be informed by genetic makeup, so you don't pull in all these people into your clinical trial that de facto will not be impacted by the drug, or even worse, they could be adversely impacted by the drug. And third, you could have pharmacogenomic discoveries where you could end up with companion diagnostics that are NGS-based that uh, are go alongside another potentially non-NGS-based treatment to inform as the efficacy of that. Uh, Geisinger is a regional healthcare center. It's an integrated healthcare center. Uh, they are, it's funny when you go to Danville, Pennsylvania, it's remote, centrally remote. It is in the middle of nowhere. It's four hours from pretty much any airport you go to. But this little country hospital system has been pioneering electronic medical records. They have their own insurance plans as well. So they're, they have a full view of their patients and they're working in a rural population that's really quite stable. So they end up with these very powerful longitudinal data sets out of their electronic medical records. Uh, it's not magic getting the data out. The EMR systems are very transaction oriented and you have to ETL this data out into a data mart. But the fact is they have information on multi-generational uh, uh, families and very stable populations in Pennsylvania, and they started the MyCode project where they're getting consented DNA samples from every patient that comes in the door, and they're updating them. So they've got this combination of data now with the genomics and the electronic medical records, which we think is a very powerful combination. Regeneron Genetic Center also thinks it's a powerful combination. It's Regeneron as a whole is a $30 billion pharma company, and they recently, I think it was in the last year and a half, have been building the Regeneron Genetic Center, which is fully online and processing massive amounts of exomes every week. But the partnership is really enabled using DNA Nexus as a platform because Regeneron has a direct connect, for instance, up into uh, our, our platform to AWS. Geisinger doesn't need that kind of bandwidth. They connect it via the internet, and we're creating these shared spaces within the platform that Regeneron can work with multiple partners, and in this case, Geisinger, to combine genomic and phenotypic data with the samples coming from Geisinger being sequenced at the Regeneron Genetic Center, the informatics being done on DNA Nexus, the results all being shared back to Geisinger via this controlled collaborative access mechanism. What I'm gonna talk about a little today is how DNA Nexus and AWS accelerate scientific discovery. It's really at the heart of what this session is about. I wanna talk a bit about the invisible things that make AWS outstanding. Uh, this is really from insight gained from having worked inside EC2 and inside AWS of professional services and understanding how DevOps is so baked into AWS and it yields the invisible benefits that we don't really think about, but they are, they are very manifest. Uh, we'll talk about the architecture of DNA Nexus and how we use the, uh, there's no new services in my talk today. It's like the plain old vanilla EC2 and S3, but I think you'll take a look at S3 in particular in a different light after we talk about this architecture. So scientific discovery, as I mentioned, the blockers, the siloing and protection of data is really an impediment to science. It is impeding delivery of improved healthcare. It's impeding research, and it is a challenging problem. These data sets are valuable. A lot of them contain protected health information. Genomic information is inherently becoming as identifiable as your fingerprint, so the handling and management of this data is critical, and what people have done to date is circle the wagons. So you've got all these siloed data sets all over the world, and people have to go through lots of hoops and hurdles in order to get them together to drive scientific insight. Security is rampantly misunderstood. Uh, I, it makes me crazy sometimes when I see the shipping of hard drives. That's how these folks are delivering their you know, multi-terabyte data sets now. They ship hard drives. And they have a local infrastructures that are, as I like to call them, the, the bonbon, where you have a hardened outside and the entire inside of their infrastructure is complete soft creamy center. So if you penetrate the outside, you're in free for all land. So, when people come and say that the cloud is less secure, it really doesn't, it's really a, a specious argument, it really is. The security is misunderstood and it's leading to some erroneous decisions at very high levels. Compliance is complex. There's an alphabet soup of regulatory uh, regimes you have to adhere to, uh, particularly if you go over into Europe, it gets even fragmented on a per country basis. 
and large-scale studies, the combination of all these phenotypic uh, records where you might have thousands of columns uh, for each of the different phenotypic attributes these patients have, combined on an axis with their genomic, their, their variants, that's a very big data set, and we really need the compute and storage brought to bear to be able to get these questions answered. So how do we address this? Collaboration is key to breaking down the, the silos that I mentioned. The collaboration has to be supported by all of these features that Angel's mentioning, and what DNA Nexus does is layer again on top of that, because Amazon really takes it up to the level of the OS, and as, as Angel pointed out, you're still responsible for patching your OS. We take it up yet another level where there is no OS for you to manage. You can deploy pipelines onto our system, run it, but all the sausage making again is really handled by DNA Nexus in the back end. So our customers are doing science. They're not doing IT at all. And the combination of the foundation of AWS with the layers we bring on top of it provides a very highly secure performant platform for our customers to use. Security, security, security again, and compliance is critical. The platform we've built, all of the data is transited in SSL and HTTPS, so everything's encrypted on the wire, everything's encrypted at rest. The only time that data is unencrypted in DNA Nexus is when it's in a worker node in RAM. And when that worker node's done, it's blown away. And the decryption for that worker node, the decryption keys for that worker node are thrown away. So our customers have really liked this position until homomorphic encryption, and you can look that up, becomes feasible for genetic analysis. It's gonna be this way. This is, this is the best it's gonna get. You're going to encrypt things in RAM and keep everything very well protected. Uh, customers, again, are very amenable to this, and it's starting to break down the silos of these data structures. Big data and massive compute power. This is not for the faint of heart. Uh, that uh, 30 million uh, core hours I mentioned, we're gonna blow that away over the next few weeks, probably by a factor of five. Um, we're probably gonna be bringing on 200,000 cores to solve a specific cohort problem um, around Alzheimer's, combining the data from this charge consortium with Alzheimer's data. And you can start to see when you bring these resources to bear that the lights go on and start inside the scientists and researchers and they start thinking, wow, I can do things that I just could not even physically do before, and that's really driving science. And what we're really providing with DNA Nexus is a platform for science with really no IT entanglement. The invisible AWS, under the hood, which you, you, know, you won't see it in the keynotes, although I will, you know, I felt like Andy stole a bit of my thunder on his keynote at the end yesterday when he was talking about uh, the core values and customer obsession. Uh, and these are things that you might hear about from the outside, but when you experience it from the inside, you'll find that this stuff actually really works. It's not just a bunch of platitudes and a mission statement. You have a, a, a regimen, a set of specs that an entire company is built upon, and it's amazingly successful, and we at DNA Nexus leverage all those things. I really like to think that AWS is probably the best example of the state of DevOps, and some of these things I'm talking about here really do apply to DevOps. So I'm sure lots of folks here are very, very familiar with DevOps. To me, coming from decades and decades ago, um, this stuff is not magic, it's not new. It comes out of Deming, uh, Toyota, total quality management. These principles are really straightforward. You gotta measure what you're doing or you have no idea what's really going on. You have to improve your process, and learn from your mistakes, otherwise you're destined to repeat them. So one of the aspects that I found fascinating within Amazon was the metric systems. If you think of the breadth of services and the depth of the services and the velocity of data coming in from a service like EC2 or S3, it's overwhelming to think of what the internal metrics look like inside Amazon. Yet these metrics are used to drive capacity planning, incident response, error correction. They're at the heart of everything that goes on inside Amazon. And you will find that Amazon is rapidly metrics driven. Continuous improvement. Uh, they, Amazon has a full formal process. I'm sure everybody's seen bug ticketing. Yeah, you got a bug, okay, file the ticket, all right, great. But it doesn't stop there. There's a whole system for continuous improvement. It's not enough to say something broke, or we had a system incident, or we had a router go gray on us and cause some you know, routing problems in an AZ. When that happens at Amazon, there is a full process for driving at root cause, and you'll hear these terms like the five whys, 
why did this happen, what was the sub-cost of that, but it's a full formal process with a database behind it and everything. Every bit as formal as bug tracking, and it loops back the learnings into the system, and I can personally say from my experience working in EC2 starting in 2011 to here we stand on the brink of 2015, EC2 is doing great. I mean, it is really doing well. Um, S3, the same thing. We just use it for now for years without even thinking about it. Sure, you have a node go down and they send you a message saying, yep, you know, this instance is going to be retired. But as a whole, if you've architected for multi-AZ and high availability, you can build pretty much 100% uptime on Amazon. Uh, customer obsession, this is, like I said, Andy stole my thunder, but uh, customer obsession is really baked in. Everything that's done is starting at the customer and working backwards. And it really works. And I do consider AWS to be the state of the art for DevOps. Now I'm going to start inside out. This is not going to be a code level architecture. You won't see any you know, complex stacks or anything. But this should give you a different perspective of how you can look at some of the core services on Amazon Web Services and really build things in a different way. So when you think of S3, we think of S3 as a center of our universe. And you know, you'll think of it, you'll think trillions of objects, unlimited storage. But what really is interesting about S3 is the storage performance. The cross-sectional bandwidth from EC2 to S3 is pretty insane. We launched thousands of nodes, each ingesting a 300 gigabyte payload from S3. And you know how much I worry about storage performance? Not. Zero. It just works. Contrarily, in a local cluster, you're likely to have an NFS central storage system. The more data you add to it, the slower it goes. The more clients you add to it, the slower it goes. And when you want to upgrade, it's adding a new shelf for lots and lots of zeros. And it's a whole performance. It's a huge operational task managing storage performance. So S3 uh, and the cross-sectional bandwidth to EC2 really allows us to take the storage performance problem off of our customer's table. The other thing that's lovely about S3 is the 11 nines of durability. The 11 nines really allows us to change the backup architecture for our customers as well. Moving out, we have the job manager with our work payloads. The job manager is resilient to instance failure, so it allows us to take advantage of transient resources like Spot. We can select instance types based on the actual stage of the pipeline, more RAM if you need it, less, more cores if you need it. And the job manager presents standard I.O. logs, standard error logs to users. So the experience for the bioinformatician is much like working on a command line Linux shell, just like they're used to. But with the entire power of thousands of core, thousands of nodes, and you know, petabytes of storage behind it. Moving out another layer, we have our application services. Everything on DNA Nexus is served via the API. It's a first class API. The web interface rests on top of it. The CLI rests on top of it. The language bindings all rest on top of the API. And the API, we, of course, we use Elastic Load Balancer for load distribution and for uh, doing up, rolling upgrades without any downtime. Another little favorite part of mine is the detailed billing report. You won't hear a lot about that in many talks, but the detailed billing report is immensely powerful. Taking the data from this detailed billing report, combining it with the data from our job manager, I can see in excruciating detail exactly what things are costing me, what my margins are, everything. And I've leveraged a product, uh, another partner from Amazon, Tableau, which I really feel strongly about as well, fantastic product, to present these visualizations using Redshift under the hood. The network side is direct connect in the case of Regeneron, internet connection in the case of Geisinger on the, the red square, and now this ecosystem can start evolving. We're also setting up private uh, VPCs that we can offer other services besides just DNA Nexus and provide VPC peering. The thing that also is about, uh, nice about the direct connect is it lowers your cost of internet egress by a very large factor. Uh, work with the Direct Connect team if you're dealing with any of this stuff. They're just fantastic to work with, and you'll end up with a very powerful configuration. And last but not least, really what we're trying to do is connect science, connect the charge consortium, allow ENCODE to do their data access controls and distribution of data, connect partners uh, to be able to drive scientific discovery. Uh, I'd like to introduce Jeff Reed, my colleague from the Regeneron Genetic Center. I've had the privilege and pleasure of working with Jeff both at the Baylor College of Medicine and at Regeneron, and he's an absolute rock star, and now you'll get some really interesting science. Well, thanks, Omar. It was very nice of you to say.
I don't know that I reached Skrillex levels yet, but. Um. Uh, all right, so l l let me try to give you guys now a little bit of the kind of juicy meat. Talk a little bit about what science this really enables and, and the things that we're doing at the Regeneron Genetics Center and how the stuff under the hood from Omar at DNA Nexus and from Angel and the whole AWS team really helps out. So this was a picture from this winter. Now, the problem with our commitment to the cloud is I don't have anything to show on a tour. So we had this room. This actually room was spec'd out to be the server room. It has power and cooling that you would need. I put a little picture of a cloud on the window so I could sort of say, hey, you know, this is the cloud. And, and our CSO said, no, 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 you got to get the cloud in the room. So, so here you see the, 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 the picture of, of Foggy, the fog machine, giving us a cloud in the room, unfortunately. Uh, ask me about fog machines and fire alarms. I'll tell you about it later. So um, what we're doing with Geisinger, I, I think, is really transformative and really interesting. So right now, we're in the process at 1,000 exomes a week of, of basically building what is, I believe, going to be the largest and most comprehensive resource that combines genotype and clinical data. There's, there's been a lot of discussion around the kind of future of genomic medicine and how medicine is going to really be, you know, fundamentally transformed by genomics, but it's really hard to get at that connection between the genotype data of a particular individual and their full EMR. If you look at what most research projects are doing, what they get is a very summarized form. Somebody goes and sees a physician and, and, and they say, okay, well, you have this serious genetic disease and we'll sequence you for this reason, but you don't get that full EMR picture. And that's, that's what we really get in our partnership with the Geisinger Health System. Now, as, as Omar pointed out, this is a health system that serves around two and a half million people. They are one of the earliest adopters of the EMR in the U.S. And one of the things that's, that's very interesting interesting about them is they really have cradle-to-grave records. Very few people move in and very few people move out of the area in Pennsylvania that they serve. And so we get longitudinal EMR data on people all the way back to the 90s and in some cases the, the late 80s from when they were really first in, engaging with the EMR. And so our partnership with them really allows us to have access to this genomic data and, and the CMR data, and it gives them the genomic data that they can then clinically validate and report back to their patients. And as I said, this is now rolling at, at a rate of about 1,000 exomes a week. Now, now, the technology we use to do this, I, I wanted to show this slide because I don't know that everybody is really aware of this revolution that's gone on in sequencing technology. So what we have at the RGC, we think uh, the things that we've done are, are really best in class. We have a, a Lyconic biobank, I like to call it a vending machine for samples. So you go up and you put a dollar in and press E3 and you, know, you get the E3 sample back out. So we have total sample storage automation. The robot you see there is uh, really a collaboration between the Regeneron Genetics Center automation team and Hamilton Robotics, where we built essentially completely automated library prep workflow. That's incredibly valuable in terms of just making a lab that can sequence at scale, but it also has a huge impact on the data, because what that means is the, the samples are all consistently prepared, and so the sequencing all behaves consistently, and in the downstream analysis, because of that consistency, it really helps us in terms of interpretation of the data. And then uh, the Illumina HiSeq fleet that we use to sequence all that. Uh, some of you may be aware that uh, there's, you know, been this revolution in sequencing technology that's really down to um, the, the sort of genius of molecular biology coupled with uh, increasingly high resolution digital cameras, and, and that's what the, these Illumina sequencers really do. But what we've uh, built together with the, the Nexus guys is really the first totally cloud-based analysis platform for this kind of large-scale sequencing center. So our sequencing instruments dump their raw data into a buffer server, a minor little piece of hardware that sits, and then immediately that data gets bundled and pushed uh, up to AWS in the DNA Nexus space. That's about seven, what I would call gigabase pairs, seven billion base pairs of sequence reads for each individual. The pipeline is automatically kicked off, uh, generating those reads from the raw data, aligning those reads to the reference genome, which is incredibly important because uh, most genetics is really in terms of understanding how your genome differs from the standard reference. That, that's the variant calling process where we identify variants, differences between you and the reference genome. And then marrying that together with the genomics literature so we can create this annotated list, an incredibly rich annotation that we do. It's about 700 individual elements of annotation, things like uh, population frequency 
frequencies of variance or, or whether a variant is known to be deleterious or not. And so we get around 25,000 coding variants. That's variants in the regions of your genome that code for proteins in each individual, all with data QC that lets us understand if the sequencing worked or didn't and, and if anything went wrong. Now that's all there in place. The things I want to talk a little more about that I think are more interesting are the things that we're working on building now. So as we're generating these, each individual's DNA sequence, each individual's 25,000 variants in the coding region, that's getting aggregated into a centralized resource. And it allows us to cut off large swaths of samples and do population-based studies, the things that Omar was referring to, like the CHARGE data or the ADSP data, the Alzheimer's Disease Sequencing Project data, where you need a very large number of people to try to identify cases and controls and then understand what subtle genetic signals are. We can also carve out individual families. So the pedigree you see here in the family-based studies is my favorite hemophilia pedigree. It's also known as the royal family of England. And what you can do is you can take people who are quite related in, in a small or even a large pedigree, identify people who are affected, identify people who are unaffected, do a subtraction and try to understand what we would call Mendelian disease, disease where the inheritance pattern is, is very clear and known. So, so these are things that people have kind of done before. The things that we're working on, on now, the things that I think are kind of you know, futuristic about what the RGC is attempting, we have a functionality that I like to call the Eye of Sauron now. So this is, this is a total genetics dream. As we're sequencing thousands of people, a thousand people a week, we have a tool that can sit and watch and look for an individual who has a particular variant or an individual who has a particular loss of function gene, the things that, that I would characterize as human knockouts. So we can then trigger that to marry that data to the EMR. So now it's no longer a matter of knowing what a particular individual's genetic disease is and going and searching after the particular genetics. We can look from the other direction. We can say, I'm interested in people who have a loss of function in a particular gene, and I want to know how that expresses in their phenotype, and I can marry that up to the EMR. So here's a cool example. Oh, sorry. I, so um, before I get to the cool example, let me point out that security is kind of paramount here. So the thing we're talking about is really marrying up EMR data with genetics data. Your EMR knows everything you tell your doctor. It knows actually a lot of things you don't tell your doctor because your health is informative about you in ways that you don't necessarily know. And right now, the genome is not considered personal health care information, but if you think about it, if somebody finds uh, you know, a body and they want to identify it, it's not like they go searching for the social security number, right? They sequence microsatellites, they do uh, DNA testing. A and so we're expecting that very soon everything that we're doing with genomics and with phenotype data is going to have to be under uh, HIPAA compliance, although that's not there yet. So putting these two things together requires a high level of security, and that's, that's really one of the most compelling things behind using DNA Nexus and AWS. But now to the interesting example. So, so this is a real-world example. This is a, a patient that had a particular variant in a particular gene that was of interest to us. Um, now, some of this data was changed so that none of, uh, there's sort of no way of identifying this patient from this information. But this is a, a, a subtle slice of the huge richness of the EMR. So we get demographics information. We get to know things like the person's age, their sex, their race, their ethnicity. This is actually incredibly important from a genetics perspective, although we can also infer ethnicity usually just from looking at the genetics data. We also get uh, data from the problem list. If, if you went to the doctor and you had a surgery, if you went to the doctor and you had a serious problem, they'll enter into the problem list. So the example here is something like a knee joint replacement that was done in 2006. We also get an incredibly rich medications table. Now, uh, the two problems with the medications table are, one, not everybody actually takes every drug they're prescribed, and it's incredibly difficult to know, you know, whether this was just written out as a script or whether somebody actually took the pills when they were supposed to. The other thing is this data, one pill by mouth three times a day until gone, is actually not a controlled text field. This is like physicians can write whatever they want. And so it can be a little bit difficult actually to infer even what the actual prescription was. But the details I want to I want to get to the things that are most relevant to this phenotype are you see in the in the first graph that's BMI and this is actually BMI that's above 30. So if you know about BMI, BMI above 30 is considered obese and beyond. This is a relatively unhealthy state. 
And you see starting in around 1998, this individual's BMI crossed above 30, and then it crept up and up and up. I have the same problem over the last 10 or 15 years as well. My BMI has crept up and up and up. It's all part of aging. And then it rattled around right around 50, and you see where the pink triangle is, that's actually an intervention where this individual had a gastric bypass. So this is the reason to get the gastric bypass. Your BMI then crashes down, which is exactly what you want, although as is often the case with gastric bypass, the BMI crept up and up and up. The thing that's most interesting about this patient, though, is if you go and you look at um, some of the vitals, some of the labs that are relevant to metabolic disease, they're completely normal. So in spite of the fact that this person had a BMI above 30 creeping up to 50 over years and years and years, they have completely normal glucose, they have completely normal LDL cholesterol, they have completely normal triglycerides. This is not someone who has diabetes. This is not someone who has serious metabolic disease. And this is exactly the phenotype that we expect from an individual who carries the genetic variant that was found here. So this is just to, to paint a picture of the example of what we're really trying to build, the ability to sequence very deeply into a very large population. And as we see knockout genes and particular variants that are of interest, we th then can reach into the EMR, and not just for one individual, but for many individuals. And then we can visualize that data. What is the average LDL cholesterol of an individual who has BMI greater than 30 over 20? years who has this particular variant or this particular gene knocked out, and then we can use that understanding of the relationship between those genes and phenotypes to feed into our drug development pipeline and hopefully be developing a large number of drugs in the near future that can impact diseases all across the spectrum of healthcare. So I do want to say one last thing about this analysis and data security. This Again, data security here is paramount, being able to have the, the security assurances that come with DNA Nexus and AWS, the ability to sign HIPAA business agreements will be increasingly important as this kind of data is really under that kind of framework. Um, and, and then getting to that idea of building a data hub. So we have partners, right? The Geisinger Health System has a huge investment in this data. They're accessing this data through DNA Nexus as, you know, we're building the data as sort of the central hub, and then they can come. And our other partners as well, we have uh, sequencing relationships now with Columbia University Medical Center and with the Clinic for Special Children, and we're really trying to create a, a massive resource of genomic data, bringing in as much phenotype information as possible, and then connecting up the individuals who are really working with these patients and really understand these diseases and phenotypes to really help us shift towards a data-driven genomic medicine, which is not the medicine we have now, but is the thing that, that we all know is really coming, and it really will help realize and, and revolutionize med medical uh, care and the developments of drugs. So um, with that, I think we're done, and um, thank you all, and if, I guess if you have questions, we can take them afterwards. That was great. Um, we're actually going to have questions outside of the room. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody and uh, uh, thank Omar, thank Jeff. This has been a great, great reinvent, and thank you for sticking around and have fun at the party tonight. Again, we're, we're outside, right outside. Uh, you can reach us. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone.